so welcome everyone to episode 58 um of podchat live and and the topic of discussion is motivational interviewing which um well, well if you're not familiar with what it is that's exactly what, what the the goal of this episode is it's i did a little search earlier just to to see how popular it was um uh, in the sort of um out there in the in the internet world and on, on pubmed there's well over four thousand papers published on motivational interviewing the ma vast majority of which outside the world uh, the realms of, of directly of podiatry more in things like smoking cessation and weight loss and yeah. and things like this um on google scholar 191,000 hits um, and we, we're delighted to have three uh, guests with us today, all of whom have contributed to, to those numbers in, in some way, mostly within the realm of uh, the diabetic foot and behaviour change and adherence to uh, behaviours that would reduce diabetic foot ulcerations and, and the use of foot orthoses and footwear, which, which we'll let them talk about more. So uh, massive thanks and welcome to Joanne Patton from University of Plymouth, uh, Jodie Binning from Glasgow Caledonian and Andrew Hill, who's we're going to affiliate with the University of Bath because that's where he's doing, even though you don't work there, I know that's where you're doing your, your professional doctorate. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, we're going to start by, I guess, just introducing the audience to motivational interviewing. Uh, what is it? The first time I, I sort of um, asked someone what it was when I started showing interest, they said to me, just think of it as the language of behaviour change. And I thought that was kind of a nice, uh, albeit very, very uh, brief way of, of summarising it. But um, let me uh, just, I'm just going to pick on Joanne first, if that's okay. And, and let me just ask you, Joanne, um, if someone were to say to you who is completely new to motivational interviewing, well, I'm a podiatrist, I don't know what this is. Uh, sh why do I care? You know, so what is it and, and why, why should I care? What, what, how would you feel that kind of question? Well, I think, um, first of all, it's uh, a community, communication technique it's a tool um, certainly within healthcare there's a there's a shift towards patient empowerment and patient centered care and for me motivational interviewing is a communication technique that allows me um, to interact with a patient in such a way as to uh, allow them to be empowered within the uh, consultation it's often described more as dancing with the patient rather than um, telling the patient. So it's a very gentle and collaborative technique. Perfect. Um, Jodie, anything? I saw you nodding, nodding along, obviously. Uh, is there anything else you think uh, you would add? I don't think so. I don't think it's too, uh, I don't, like Joanne, I don't think it's too complex in its in its definition. I think it is a communication technique, a way of talking with someone, not at someone. And as Joanna said, it's around um, sitting alongside someone rather than being in a position of expert opinion. Um, it's very much uh, that collaborative approach. So yeah, I would I would agree that that, as Joanna said, that's that's pretty much how I see it. Perfect. And and Andrew, I'll come to you. We've I've definitely mm. been in discussions with you and, and in groups of people on various fora where we've time and time again said, uh, you know, it's all you know, it's all in the history taking. Three most important things are history, history, history. And I think uh, we're very much taught that, you know, from undergraduate onwards uh, about how to take history with regard to what questions to ask. But perhaps um, you know, when we're young and we, we don't have that bedside manner yet, we haven't quite learnt the. Um, you know, for me, motivational interviewing isn't just necessarily about teaching people what to ask. It's like, like Joanne and Jodie have already said, it's how do we, how do we phrase these questions? What sort of language do we use? Um, what, what, what's your take on this to the, the completely sort of new person to MI? We're going to shorten it to MI from now on, if that's okay with everyone. <laughs> yes, I'm good. <laughs> so we don't keep saying it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose my sort of biggest take home from all of it uh, when I've been looking at this is that... Uh, and actually, when I was first getting into this, I reflect a lot of what I saw as a, as a clinician in that you do your kind of interview style patient history taking and you're, you're asking a lot of questions and you're kind of getting some positive responses, not really getting a lot. Then 20 minutes later or 10 minutes later, you're having a conversation about something else and the patient starts divulging what essentially is more of the history that didn't come from the interview bit. Um, and actually, I suppose if we look at motivation interviewing in that, particular context it's just about really speaking to the patient about what's on their mind um, as the sort of primary 
in, if you like, of your, of your conversation. And from that, actually, your history taking gets ever more efficient uh, because you can find that just through a good listening style and then gently sort of nudging questions, you can get some really rich uh, information, which kind of means you don't have to do what feels like a more formal assessment. Mm, I think it's the, the traditional form of assessment um, is made up of closed ended questions mm. where the patient yeah. uh, usually a passive recipient. Um, and that puts you in a position really of, of power, if you like, and um, disempowers the patient. And I think mm. what motivational interview or MI um, allows you to do <laughs> is allows the patient to lead the discussion. So it's all about what's most important for them. Um, and so you use much more open ended questions and let the patient tell you their story rather than being led by the cl clinician. Perfect. And I should probably have said, it probably a miss of me not to have said that, that it was uh, first sort of framed as MI uh, by uh, psychologists Miller and Rolnick in, you know, I think mm. I'm right in saying if my, if my research is throughout the early 80s. But sort of if you go back as far as the work of, of Carl Rogers in the late 50s, early 60s, even he was talking about sort of accurate empathy and, and the person-centred approach. So what's your thoughts, guys, all of you really, on, on when these sort of thoughts and theories have been floating around for since the late 50s, longer than all of us, possibly not Craig, um, but certainly longer than the rest of us. Why now? I mean, we're kind of talking now and everyone's kind of saying, right, we need to move towards this patient-centred approach. Why are we only just moving towards it in 2019 when, when it seems like it's been uh, known about for, for far, far longer? Well, I'll let you fight over think, that one. Well, I'll jump in first if you don't mind. Oh, sorry, go on. Well, so I was just going to say that um, I think it has been uh, quite well established in, in, in sort of very specific disciplines. So with, within sort of realms of counselling and psychology, this has been very well established. And I, and, um, I think Rolnick has been quoted as saying that at the time in the early 80s when him and Miller were, were sort of first sort of talking about this, they, they very much sort of felt a little bit like they were the, the dissenting voices amongst um, particularly things like addiction and smoking cessation and all these sorts of things. Um, I think the, the modern bit of it, I think, is it's just taken a while to, to spread its tentacles into other aspects of healthcare. Um, and I think actually what all healthcare professions are probably starting to do is realise that their role goes beyond their very narrow focus and discipline. And actually we're all kind of involved in the, in the overall holistic care of, of our patients. Um, so, so my take is that it's just sort of led into other disciplines um, a bit more slowly. I think it's um, there's been a more fundamental shift than that, um, particularly in the NHS in the UK, and and I think it's moving in the US as well now. There's been a real um, problem, if you like, with uh, overburden within the NHS and how we're going to cope with the increased cap patient capacity, particularly within um, diabetic care. And the problem is that using the traditional model of, of treating patients and doing things for patients, the, uh, the healthcare systems just don't have capacity. So there's now a real shift towards patient self-management. Um, and I think as part of that shift, MI lends itself as a, as a tool um, and a communication method to encourage self-management. Do you agree, Jodie? I don't disagree with either either of those opinions. I've got a slightly more contentious view, however, around Lovely. why it, it, it might be uh, slow to be adopted. And I think it might be to do with the fact that we believe that we're patient centred already. And I think mm. that we believe that we are uh, kind, compassionate and caring, which of course we are. But that isn't the same as the approach in motivational interviewing where you really are looking through a different lens and the approaches and techniques are really very different so I think um, it's not that we haven't been person-centered which re its roots are in uh, Rogers and, and uh, described a, a long time ago I just think putting those into practice requires a completely different mindset um, which uh, uh, we haven't necessarily focused on because maybe we've been obsessed with knowledge rather than behaviors I think we've mm -hmm. been so been so yeah, I, I agree, yeah, Jodie. So and to get the perfect advice sheet or the perfect delivery of advice, um, which is all knowledge based, and haven't really up until now focused on 
you know, the fact that knowledge doesn't translate into doing. And I think we're trained to be fixers and problem solvers. And um, in, in our traditional uh, patient centered approach, we want to help the patient so much um, that, that we find it difficult to let go and let them help themselves. And in some instances, actually not help them because that's actually their choice. Um, you know, we're taught from, from first year graduates that, you know, we need to fix everything. Um, and that's not, not quite the ethos that MI uh, allows you to, 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 and the NHS is all, also measured by outcomes how many orthotics you've issued, um, pain reduction, those sorts of outcomes. And again, it goes against what MI is all about, where actually the patient may choose not to have insoles, do you know? So. Yeah, I think yeah. patient expectation comes in quite heavily here because um, on one hand, you're right, you know, we, we have been trained in a certain way to, to approach consultations a certain way. Um, and I think there's also generally from patients that kind of they, they turn up to a medical professional and, and what they're expecting is a lot of answers. Um, maybe what they're not expecting is something that's more akin to counselling. And it's just worth stressing that, you know, motivational interviewing for all of its fantastic qualities, it's not going to be suitable in every patient encounter for every, you know, everything that we need to maybe um, you know, do within the, the roles of our, our jobs as podiatrists. There may be moments where it, it's less crucial than others. I think that's an important Perfect. point is we may have lost the the uh, the thread that the focus of motivational interviewing is about change so if somebody doesn't need to change and are already motivated and very able capable um, and aligned to that that you would like them to do and adherent then motivational interviewing isn't needed similarly if somebody doesn't have the capacity to change then motivational interviewing might not be appropriate so um, MI is about does have a focus on change and it is directional so in a in a particular direction uh, perceived to be uh, a, a good direction for improved health perfect this segues beautifully into the next line of question which is essentially why why people don't change and we're talking about behavior you know to to, to, to make it clear and um we you know we touched on there you know that we we have this sort of uh we, we, we're taught to we, it's ingrained within us that we're the experts we're the specialists we've got our certificate on the wall we're very quite rightly quite proud of our, the level of study that we've put in the level of knowledge we've attained so when someone comes in and they, they sit in our room they're going to do what we say because we we're the one with the certificate on the wall and they've got the problem and we just we're just going to tell them how to how to how to do it and and we all know because we're all clinicians and we have been for many years that that doesn't always work out that way people don't change their footwear they don't adhere to the rehabilitation program they've been given they don't um do many many things that we tell them to do which we are telling them to do from a very good good position so i'll come to you on this one jody if i may just because you were the one that, that just brought it up um mm. why, why don't people change why don't pay why aren't patients good patients why won't they just do what we tell them to do it's because behaviours and what drives behaviours uh, are, are complex. So we have to be capable, we have to have the knowledge, we have to believe that it's a good thing to do. Um, and MI talks a lot about ambivalence. And um, what is meant by ambivalence in MI terms is that, that people feel more than one way about something, which we all do. So, uh, for example, I feel that it's good to go to the gym and and be fit and healthy but sometimes I also feel that I want to go home and eat cake so it's just that <laughs> you know people feel more than more than one way about behaviors and, and and behaviors are fleeting so what I might feel today might not be the same tomorrow um, and we can see we only see patients in a in a snapshot um, and although their values and beliefs may not change their day-to-day -day behaviors and how it plays out um, can be influenced by so many things, uh, social environment, opportunity, uh, capability. So it's really very, very complex. So then maybe that's some, some of the reasons why people don't do what we want them to do. Yeah. And if I flip that question on its head and, and pitch it to you, uh, Joanne, um, what reasons do people have for changing? You know, some patients, they come in and from, from minute one, they're just, they're just listening and they're, they're, you've got the buy-in, they're engaged and they, they do, you know, you could tell them, as I always say, some patients, you always say, oh, that 
for that patella femoral pain you just need to rub a parsnip on it and that'll make and you know they would you know it, we say it jokingly is it is it just the opposite of what's jody's jody said or is it is it something else yeah, I, I think it's quite individual, first of all. Um, in, in my clinic, what I tend to do is get people to fill in a pre-questionnaire. And the first question on that questionnaire is how important is it for you to have insoles? And these are people with diabetes and neuropathy. Um, and it's just a 10-point scale. So when they come in the room, I already know their readiness for change. And by the fact that they've actually turned up to the appointment, would show that they're at least ambivalent. You know, the, the fact they've bothered to, to turn up to an appointment which they uh, is clearly set out to provide them insoles would tell me that they're, they're, they have at least some interest in insoles. Um, some of my patients come in and, and it's a 10 out of 10. And therefore, I know already that really I'm preaching to the converted and I don't need to to talk to them about change in terms of in, in a motivational way. But those who, who score a five or so, um, then that's different. And, and, and the difference between those patients are, are often down to um, how their reasons for insoles. Um, and with people with diabetes and neuropathy, it's often not for foot protection. The, the people that come in who want insoles for foot protection and who are very motivated or are those who have already had an amputation or, or have already suffered the burden of a, a foot ulcer. Um, and, you know, for them, there's a clear benefit to insoles and they completely understand that insoles are for ulcer prevention. But the large majority of my preventative patients, really the, the motivation for having insoles particularly is around um, well-being and function. So walking better, um, being more independent um, and comfort. So, uh, it, and not related to their diabetes or, or their medical health at all. Um, and things that put them off wearing insoles specifically uh, is, is down to whether they think the insoles are gonna have an immediate benefit to them um, and whether the insoles are gonna fit with their daily lives. And, and, and I use the MI really to try and, and um, find out what's important to them um, and, then, and, and then use that consultation to, to explore how insoles can be of benefit to them. Yeah, it's, it's actually really great to hear you say that you use the 0 to 10 scale to ask them, you know, when they come in to ask them where, where their beliefs are before before anything for two reasons yeah. firstly because i don't think we we're, we're taught enough to ask people about their beliefs when they walk in what what they bring with them and they all bring something with them um yeah. but also since i went on my uh, my my mi knowledge compared to you guys is very minimal so i apologize for that but since i went on my little um two-day course we we were taught to do this this naught to ten scale about you know whatever behavior it is so on a scale of naught to ten how likely are you to do the rehabilitation exercises i'm going to give you or how you yeah. know what's your current uh, belief on um whether you 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 think you need orthoses and then we were taught that when they give an answer when they say uh, two to sort of say okay why aren't you lower you know to, to put it back question. to them yeah, yeah absolutely right. um or, or or the other question i'm sure you know as well is what what would have to happen for you to be one to two points mm -hmm. higher um so rather than kind of meeting the belief which already clearly is uh, two out of ten so they, they brought something with them that you think this is a barrier where you just reflect it back we'll come back onto reflections in a minute but i think that's um mm. yeah it's nice to hear that that my my little couple of hundred pound two-day course is on par with your level of knowledge i'm kind of <laughs> kind of feeling and quite I, good about that and after the after the um history taking etc again i asked them the same question about how important insoles are and whether they want insoles and actually i i tend not to go through to actually provide the patient with insoles until i've got that commitment and and that yeah. may take one or two or three appointments but but there's no point forcing an insole on somebody who is not ready to receive it or doesn't isn't asking for it um and then at discharge i ask them one last time um but i phrase it slightly differently i say how important are your insoles to you um and then i and then see if there's been a shift in in you know how they feel about using their insoles yeah awesome and that's just so different to like we said the old model of someone coming in we tell them what they need to do we give them the insoles we say go and wear these and then they 
we lose them to follow up. The insoles end up somewhere in their wardrobe and, and they become a statistic. It's just, yeah. Um, Andrew, let me bring you in mm. and, and ask, um, I sort of touched on it earlier, but I just want to bring it back. We've talked about kind of why, why, the, why the patient isn't playing their role of good patient and doing the, all the things we say. I mean, it's already become clear why this should be important for podiatrists, but can you just sort of hammer home how important this is for well, all medical professionals really to, to at least not rush off and look mm -hmm. on a an MI course, but just have a real understanding yeah. of the point we're trying to get at here. So absolutely. So, I mean, just, just to, to follow on from the points that were just raised about <laughs> patients, reasons for motivation and, and ambiv ambivalence is a really, is a really key point here. Um, but I think I shared with you in a little while ago that, that uh, papers, the, you know, the, the myth of the unmotivated person. Um, and, and there is that sort of, central tenet that actually everybody somewhere has has a motivation to do something so a lot of what we're trying to do is, is to try and get to that in one way or another and in, in, in the question specifically about podiatry i mean i think actually podiatry is relatively uniquely placed as a profession that can really run with this um, and i say that because whilst you do get um, some forms of motivation interviewing that very skilled uh, interviewers can can maybe uh, get to uh, the, the heart of the matter quite quickly and, and not take very long in a consultation the reality is for a lot of people and particularly beginners they're going to have to really build that rapport with the patient um, they're really going to have to sort of get those trust levels up and quite high um, and so with that sort of premise um, you are probably going to sort of find that people who have that kind of longitudinal contact with their patients are going to sort of get more out of this because actually they they end up seeing that person regularly over many months even years um, and they build up a really strong relationship with that person. And of course, each time some motivating interviewing techniques need to come into play, it probably gets that much quicker and that much easier when that relationship is established. So there's, you know, think about podiatry in our contact. And for a moment, I'll talk about, you know, from the diabetes context. Well, actually, that person will have a lot of contact with that patient, whether it be from something as, as routine nail care all the way through to part of the ulcer management team, part of the offloading, whatever it will be. Um, and so you have such continual contact with that person, uh, possibly more so than have with any other health professional, you can have a really, really key role. But as we've already mentioned, this, this doesn't you know, confine to diabetes by any stretch of imagination. You can very clearly make a case for it in, in the context of your MSK caseloads and so on. So the reason I think we all need to be really familiar with it um, is that I think it is a fundamental shift in the way that we view our relationship. Um, and there's, there's a great sort of meme type thing that, that, that's been around for years that sort of says um, from a patient's perspective, you know, don't, don't confuse your two hour lecture on my condition with my lived experience of the disease. And, and it comes back to that, you know, patients are experts in their condition and also they're going to be experts in what motivates them. Um, our job is to kind of be really good detectives and kind of figure out uh, what, what's going on under the, the bonnet, so to speak. Um, so I think all healthcare professions should, should certainly have this as part of their fundamental training. Um, and I know a lot of us didn't get that. So, you know, I would encourage CPD, you know, 100 percent. Perfect. And before we come on to um, we'll touch on what this might look properly look like in clinic and we'll touch on um, right at the end. That's reminded me we must touch on um, sort of tools where we can send people to do. You know, there's a great app out there and there's good books and stuff so i'm just scribbling to myself that we mentioned that at the end um the one thing that was said to me when i first explained to someone i was doing this course um and i sort of crude probably a narrative on the way i explained it but, but they, they, it sort of was fired back at me oh so you're basically going on a course to get better at persuading people or you know people you know we talk about the patients that are non-compliant and we're going to get better at, at, at making them compliant and and it was pretty clear to me that when I first went on this course that that isn't in what they refer to as the spirit of MI. This isn't about coercing people, rubber arming them, persuading them. Um, could I get your, your guys sort of take on, on you know, uh, maybe touch on what the MI spirit is um, and how we need to make sure we're, we're being clear here that we're still being utterly ethical um, medical practitioners and we're not being car salesmen. Um, let's go to, we'll go to you, Jodie. Um. I always think that the MI spirit is uh, the the how I need to be question. This is how I need to be. And it's based on a lot of the evidence around uh, counsellor or clinician um, style and delivery of communication and the impact that that has 
on the patient or the client. Um, and there is quite a bit of evidence that shows that the empathy, collaborative style, um, and some of the tools around that, some simple techniques around asking permission. Um, so if you're, if you're saying to your patient, is it okay if I ask you about your experience of having that foot ulcer or your experience of wearing that orthotic or the pain that you are in, if you ask permission, it automatically puts them in a position of control and power. And the dialogue that then happens after that is very much different to the normal assessment process that we may be used to or that we heard about earlier. So the MI spirit um, is that is that um, how I need to be as a clinician and that that might be slightly different to um, the expert practitioner. Um, compassion is another key component of that and the ability to um, know when to bring up the issue around a change ambivalence when to move from that engagement into what should we focus on what is it that you would like to focus on um is is probably the key spirit as far as i i can uh, decipher from my own practice and from from the reading brilliant um joanne what, what, what are your thoughts um i think in, in terms of uh, the style of MI, I think one of the most important things I've learned is active listening. And it's, it's about being comfortable with those silences, uh, giving your patient time and space to tell their story. Um, and, and also just having the ability to um, delve deeper in, into uh, what they're telling you by reflecting back or summarising certain points that they, they might be talking about so trying to pick up in the conversation key phrases that will either allow you to get better insight into what is important to them or uh, listen listening for that change talk so that you can reflect back to them so that they can then find a way forward themselves and find a solution themselves as to how they can actually change in their day-to-day -day lives so Active listening, I think, is is the most important skill that I think MI provides the clinician with. Yeah, I think there's this horrible statistic that the average clinician in, interrupts the, the patient when they're telling their story after a, around about 23 oh. seconds or something horrifying like that. Um, just because when we, we ask a question and they start going off uh, in a direction, we, we're, we're looking at the clock, we know we've got a full waiting room and we, we yeah. kind of try and rein the discussion back to where we want it or with or the worst thing being someone sitting there looking at a pro forma and they have to ask questions in the order of, of the pro forma. It's not, it's not a, it doesn't feel collaborative or, or like a discussion. And I, I was told, I don't know, that in, in any general history taking you should be listening 80 percent of the time and and talking 20 percent of the time is does that resonate with you your, your guys kind of thoughts? i think that's a really good rule of thumb um absolutely and and when it's history taking it's it's not as I, as I said previously in the traditional form where you're asking a series of closed end questions this is yeah active listening where actually the patient is is telling you their story um, and you're trying really to to get uh, an idea of the situation from their perspective what it's like to be in their shoes um, and understand exactly what's important to them and, and why they're there and what they want out of the consultation yeah I think what andrew any people... oh sorry go on yeah i was just bringing it to you I anyway think what... <laughs> I think what a lot of people do, um, which is also one of those things that you, you, you kind of need a spotter, you kind of need somebody who's experienced an MI to kind of be a bit of a guide. You know, it's, it's not something any of us can do um, just without any, any sort of help. Um, but people often turn an open-ended question into a closed question. They start with a really beautiful statement in the question and then close it off. And then the patient ends up with a yes, no answer outcome. And, it, and it, it, that's really frustrating. Um, just I found really interesting just when you were asking that question about oh you know um you're just learning to convince people to uh, to, to, to change their behaviors or whatever um it was interesting because steve rolnick actually changed the initial kind of uh, three overlapping circles that he had in terms of spirit of mi uh, originally sort of focused on um evocation on acceptance um and on sort of um instilling a sense of sort of competence in people um, because he read a paper where someone had taken the mi uh, approach and said i can uh, with this technique you can convince anyone to do what you need in seven minutes <laughs> and it really sent the hairs up on the back of his neck 
and said, this is not what we sort of invented this for. So in, the, in about 10 years ago, they added another sphere of this and added compassion as part of the key spirit. They kind of say, actually, we have to go back and we have to go back and start with what the person at the center of all this, what they want out of it, what their goal is, then we can guide and facilitate because otherwise it is open to, potentially open to abuse where you take a patient where you want them to go um, and that may not have been anything to do with, with their original intentions. Actually, guys, see, um, Belinda's just posted a comment that, that's just reminded me of something that happened here a couple of weeks ago in Australia. We just had a general election and a, a political party lost who probably who thought they were going to win and they immediately changed their leader. And the next day that leader said, we're given two ears and one mouth for a reason. And Belinda's <laughs> posted a comment, you know, two ears, one mouth, active listening before you speak. So it just reminded me of what that politician said, you know, we've given two ears and one mouth for a reason. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a pretty solid take home, isn't it? If, if you come out of a consultation and you've, you've been talking more and you've been listening, you've probably not, not, not done it quite right. Let's talk about what this might look like in a consultation in, in everyday practice then. And I know your, your guys, um, I was already said of talking within the confines of the, the, the diabetic consult, but uh, this doesn't really matter because I think it, it, you know, it, it applies out, outside to everything. What, um, where, what's the best way to do this? We don't want to do any role play or anything crazy like that, but I mean, what, 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 what uh, unless you really want to, I don't know, but what, what does this look like for you guys? Um, on a daily basis is it is it really just a case of i mean are you doing this with every single person let me come to you jody and say because you obviously mentioned that this may not be appropriate for every single person so when someone comes in yeah. what's your sort of a uh, filter for you know do you, i mean is it as simple for you as okay i'm gonna i'm gonna use mi on this consultation or i'm not and how soon do you decide that and, and how do you decide that it's really context specific. So if you're working in a diabetic ulcer clinic and um, you've got a, a, a huge mess of a wound and you have urgent clinical need to deal with that, MI may, may not be possible or appropriate in, in that context. So it really does depend. You really do need to work with what's in front of you. Um, so... Um, I guess it depends on the where change fits into that consultation. Are you at the point with whether it's an MSK patient, diabetic patient, where you're beginning to look at change or adhering to something that you want somebody to adhere to, or self-care or self-management? If those are the if that's the stage that you're at, then you could consider whether MI is is appropriate. And there are some phases of, of, of you know, recognisable phases within that, depending on whether the person is showing some form of resistance or reluctance or whether there is, Joanne spoke about um, people that she sees that have turned up do generally have some motivation for wearing orthoses. But other clinics, um, you, you do find people that come in um, have turned up because they've been told to turn up and have absolutely... Uh, no in, intention of of um of maybe engaging at that stage and in that in that situation you need to just build rapport and spend all your time engaging and there's no point moving on to change too quickly um so it really is uh, a key thing of mi is deep is responding to what's in front of you rather than going by a, a mechanism or a protocol for mi that's really important. yeah yeah same same for you joanne yeah, I, I guess um, I would agree with what Jodie um, uh, communicated there. Uh, in my clinical practice, I um, provide insoles for people with diabetes. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, um, we call it the instant insole clinic and um, it's set up, people are referred to the clinic to be provided, they're diabetic, they have to be diabetic to be provided with insoles. So I guess for me, um, the clinic, every patient gets uh, an MI approach, if you want, if you like, uh, or a patient-centered approach. But I, I certainly uh, grade the amount of time and um, how gently I uh, collaborate with the patient in terms of, of what comes next, dependent on their entry questionnaire. Um, so that the patient who, who is, is completely 
uh, committed to insults, probably has had insults in the past and actually uh, wants to optimize those insults because maybe they're not they're not offloading um, as well as they might. Then uh, the MI is about uh, finding out from the patient uh, what works for them best, what's most important in terms of how they use their insoles day to day, um, and, and trying to work with the patient to work out how we can, they're already wearing them every day, but often they're not wearing them for enough of the day. Um, so it's really exploring, using MI um, as part of action planning to find out um, on a, on a, from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed, what shoes they wear and, and where, when and where they wear their insoles and whether they wear slippers about the house and then focusing the management plan and the insole we provide on that conversation. Whereas the patient who comes in who's a two or a three, then, then I start from, from a different start point. There it's, um, do, you, do you know what benefit insoles might have to you shall we talk about whether insoles may even be of benefit to you so so for me i always use mi or the spirit of mi at least but but the starting point uh, and and how that moves forward through the consultation varies depending on the patient's readiness to change or or, or and that change may be do you want insoles or it may be how can we get you to wear insoles for more of the daytime yeah. Actually, that, that's interesting, Joanne, because I, I noticed something that I, if you go back to, say, the barefoot running fad and all that kind of nonsense that went on a while, quite a while ago, there was an extraordinary amount of information online for runners on foot orthotics. Mm. And I don't know about you, Ian, but I, I at that time, was um, you, you're trying to almost elicit the runner or the patient who's a runner, their belief system. About exactly. foot orthotics, yeah. about foot orthotics, before you even suggest that as an intervention. So I, I, I like to be, conf yeah, I like to be confident in how they will respond to my suggestion, because I know they've probably Googled it before they came in, you know, and, and do foot orthotics work or something like that. So I think I think that's along the same line, and I, that to me just grew naturally out of what went on, you know, five years ago, six years ago, that, that you just had to start. You couldn't just suggest foot orthotics. You had to actually elicit their beliefs on foot orthotics that they got from fellow runners, from runners world and those kinds of issues. Yeah. And that's, yeah. And that's absolutely what MI allows you to do. Mm. It's, it's really getting inside uh, the patient's values and beliefs. Yeah. I think I'm going to have to go and it's, do that course you did Ian. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, since I, since I did the course, I would say rightly or wrongly, I'm, I'm applying these principles to, and I work purely in the, sports injury world not in the diabetic world at all but but i'm applying these principles to, to everyone i see and i was trying to work out am i doing it just because i'm really enjoying the practice which i think i am um but actually people i don't know about you and i might come to you andrew because uh, you, mm. you're you're using this a lot as well and we've been talking about this quite a bit um when i ask patients questions about their beliefs and and, and i'll actually say things to them like um you know, someone comes in with shin pain and I'll often say to them, what do you think is causing your shin pain? And they, 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 they sort of take a sit back. Like no one, no medical professional has ever asked me because obviously it's, it would historically have been considered a bit of an embarrassing thing to ask. They're coming to us for the answers. Right? But I'll often I'll say to them, what do you think is causing your pain or, or um, what do you think caused the injury? And um, the, the response I get is never negative, but it's always one of surprise. Is that, is that your experience? Um, yeah, actually, the, 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 there's quite a few really interesting nuggets that are coming out of this. Um, so when, just to almost hark back to a point made right at the beginning, I remember going to, when I was a kid, uh, the GP I had as a kid, um, he was by far and away the most loved GP at the practice because he did precisely that. And we, we, you know, we're going back to the, the, the 80s when you they'd go in and you go in with a problem and, and he would start with, well, what do you think's wrong with you? You know, and it used to disarm people a little bit, um, but you can almost see the threads of that coming through very much into this. Um, what we often talk about within, within, within MI um, is kind of the, the role that you take on as the clinician. So whether you are somebody who is, you know, at certain times needing to do, and to use the MI jargon, a lot of following. So you're there having to kind of listen intently and do a lot of active listening. There are other times where actually the role you take on is a bit more informative. So you're actually having to provide a lot of information the patient needs. 
and other times you're kind of guiding you're kind of doing you know you're asking the sort of right questions to, to elicit the person to to find their way through this um and you kind of all touched this a little bit now i think one of the key things that i tend to find really really useful moving away from what used to be called the sort of um chunk check chunk method which was give a bit of information check they've understood it and then give some more you often found I've often found people kind of give you quite a sort of perfunctory, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm on board with that. But actually there might be bits they've misconstrued or haven't really understood. So instead, one of the things I tend to adopt with a lot of patients is the elicit, provide elicit approach. So I will start with a question about what they understand um, or even what they want to talk about. Then that might lead to a, a question from them about some information they want. So I might then provide some information. And then I might ask them, what that means to them. So now I've told you this particular bit of information, maybe this particular fact. Is that something that, you know, how, how do you understand what I've said and how does that now impact your behavior? So if I'm now asking them to make a change in a certain way, I want to find out from them if that suggestion is something that really conflicts with them or if that suggestion is something that actually they could get on board with. Um, so I tend to find that I, I do typically change my consultation around that. Um, and one of the key things, I think the actual implementation of this in practice is probably the hardest bit for most people, understandably, and it definitely is for me. Um, but I think it's, if I find it, a, a, you know, you can't kind of turn it on and off. You can't going to say, right, I'm going to start using this motiv motivational interviewing now, having done nothing that was supportive of that before. So you kind of have to have this approach to all patient consultations, even if you don't run through all of the techniques um in that consultation even if it is just having that more sort of empathetic uh and general sort of genuinely concordant relationship with the patient rather than oh, i'm going to be the informant now i'm going to be the listener if that kind of makes some sense yeah 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 and actually um i was going to come to you first andrew about uh, how we try and um kind of comes back to the illicit provide illicit concept of how we try and subdue our own writing reflex um mm -hmm. and I, I was only going to come to you because i know that you and i are are uh, foolish enough unlike joanne and jody we're foolish enough to pick fights on the internet with people we disagree with whereas <laughs> these two are far too sensible and far too and, and craig you're foolish in this regard as well but you know we've all been guilty of seeing something we disagree with you know that classic meme of you know, someone up at two o'clock in the morning and their, their, their partner saying to them, come to bed. You say, well, I, I'll be there in a minute. Someone on the internet's wrong. We've all been there. Um, <laughs> and it's not a good place to be. Yeah. And, and, and I've definitely done this with my patients in the past. Craig talks about barefoot yeah. running in, in our world was, was the classic where if someone came in and they'd drunk the Kool-Aid and they'd read the blog and they'd read Born to Run and they were sitting there in their five finger shoes um, telling, you know, with, with stress fractures, of course, but telling us how good barefoot mm. running was. And we suddenly, our, you, know, our, you know, we get that writing reflex and we, we just hit them with all this information of why it's not good. They, they do not change their behavior. They, they right. double down on their beliefs and, and we, we, we get nowhere. So um, I've definitely, since I've done this course, been picking fewer fights on the internet, which I think is a good thing all around. <laughs> and actually I've been correcting people um, less quickly and the the, the yeah. bite that people always get out of me is is over pronation not a term i've ever loved and people know that so they they, they go fishing and they and actually people are getting super disappointed that i'm not biting at it anymore i feel like i'm mature mm. now I th i've got mi <laughs> to thank for, for for maturity but i mean um what what do you feel uh, andrew you're you're a bit like me in this regard as i know what do you feel yeah. about mi and how it's allowed you to suppress your own writing reflex not just in your patient consultations but in your actual life sure. as well um yeah i mean I, I don't think i've been quite as 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 good at staying quiet on the internet as i should have been and maybe that's my sort of <laughs> valve room. i do all my writing reflexes online <laughs> um to be honest with you i think i think that's the hardest thing to subdue uh, because you, you can't get out of that mindset it's really difficult to get out of that mindset of wanting to fix problems i think we're all wired to want to fix problems um, I think the, the, and it comes back to this point of ambivalence, um, and, and, and the moment it clicked for me is when you really delve into ambivalence, because somebody will have a good uh, reason for change, and people will have legitimately good reasons for things staying the same. They'll have legitimate reasons for the status quo being in place. It's harder to move from a place of doing nothing to a place of doing something. So if you then, you know, as Steve Rolnick really put it, vomited information on people, um, which is what we might get into the habit of doing is just kind of inundating them with all the info we want to give them all the education we want to give them 
you've argued so vehemently on the, on the on the positive case for change that you're actually leaving the person nothing but arguing the case against change that they want to take up that, that defensive position. So um, I don't really have a have a tip uh, at suppressing the writing reflex. I I, I stumble frequently, but um, it, it is the hardest thing to, to do. But the thing that I, I find probably the 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 constant behaviour checker is for me to constantly remind myself that it, it's the patient's agenda, not mine. Um, and actually, if I can just be aware that it's 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 about them, not me. Um, and I know that's you know really sort of basic thing to say, but I think we all can get in the habit of forgetting that. You know, we're so keen on making sure that our practice is top notch. We've done all the right things for our patients that we want to problem solve for them. And actually, there are some problems that just have to solve for themselves. So you have to suppress the the, the desire to to correct them because you're just going to find that you, you 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 piss them off. I think uh, I think Joanne's got it nailed by just not being on Facebook. That's got to be <laughs> a great. It's got to be a great starting point, hasn't it? Uh, just talk us through talk us through what what life is like without being on Facebook. Just for a second, <laughs> I, I, I understand the irony of us being live on Facebook right now. By the way, but um, I, I fantasise about about doing this. You know, I'm not quite about removing myself from technology and going and living in the woods, but I do fantasize about what is taking social media out of my life. And um, tell me what it's like. <laughs> I don't really know what to say. <laughs> than, um, may, maybe, maybe this is a time for change. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I could persuade you all not to be on Facebook. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We need to have a chat offline about this for sure. Um, <laughs> let's before I'm just conscious of the time and there's a few other things I want to get through. And when we get to an hour, you'll notice because Craig will start twitching a bit. So I'm going to get, I want, I want to, to cover, we've already touched on a few of these, but, but the, the acronym ORS, O A R S, mm. um, which if anyone Googles about, um, motiv motivational interviewing or, or buys a book or goes on a course, they'll, they'll, they'll come across this quite early on. Um, and we've already touched on the O, which is open questions, um, that we, using to trigger more than just short response and, and things um but the a and the r the s the affirmations the reflections and and the summaries um and this is a bit of a structure isn't it to the way that the kind of interaction goes could we just uh, talk on those because I, I find myself making real use of kind of reflections i know there are different types that are simple and complex and double-sided reflections but um why don't we if it's okay with you guys we've got affirmations reflections and summaries and why don't we just give you one of them each if that's okay um I don't know who wants to take on um, affirmations, but um, in the oars thing, you know, we start by answer, ask, asking an open question and then we move on to sort of affirmations. Um, uh, whoever speaks first can take it. <laughs> Silence, no one wants it. Right, I'll take affirmations, I don't mind. I don't <laughs> mind taking affirmations. Perfect. I think, you. I think you, to, to start with, uh, we, we spoke about spirit of MI and that was how we need to be as clinicians. And then the ORS acronym is the skills. What do we do? The one is how we need to be, and this is uh, what do we do? Mm. So I think it's quite a useful distinction because they can get blended um, together, but they are quite distinct. So the the affirmations um, is uh, requires to be distinguished from giving praise. So of, often we want to be caring and kind to our patients and we might say, oh, well done, you've done really well. Giving them feedback is important. But actually, it, um, praise as opposed to affirming um, something, their strengths, something that they've done um, that is, is, is demonstrates their strength. Uh, praise and affirmations are quite different. So um, an example would be, well done, you've managed to get through all that uh, traffic and the difficult hospital conditions and you found it to, to the clinic today as opposed to um, you've the affirmations would be you've made it here um, just despite having all those challenges they are different praise is um, has a flavor of uh, judgment so doesn't allow the uh, doesn't allow the the patient to necessarily feel the feel the strength and the confidence themselves. So it is again clinician led, and that's the difference. I don't know if I've explained that well but, uh, enough. I but really what, good, Jody. Well done. Yeah. Um, I think it's quite a difficult concept, but when you use it in practice, I think it's the of of all the ors affirmations has been found to have the biggest impact on change in the evidence, which is a really fascinating. I, I think it was surprising for me. That just by pointing out and somebody by pointing out somebody's strength, 
that that seems to have a bigger impact on change than open questions, reflections, or summarizing, which I, I was quite building surprised about. That. It is. It's, it's yeah. building their, their confidence and their belief in themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I should have said this before for anyone who's thinking about doing an MI course. This has massive applications to trying to deal with a three-year-old and a five-year-old boy in my house as well. <laughs> I, I, I was just just frantically trying to get one of them in the bath, and I was using affirmations to do so upstairs, like ten minutes before we went live. So even if it you worked. don't want to apply this to clinical practice, I think it makes me a slightly better parent, albeit still a very average one. So let's come on to um, let's come on to reflections. Probably probably my favourite of, of, of all of these. I don't know why. I just just I just kind of think I, I, yours too. Yeah yeah. yeah. Um, Let's go to you, Joanne, if, if that's okay. Um, can you just, yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we don't want to necessarily go through simple, complex, double-sided, but just, just give everyone a bit, of a, a bit of an overview of what reflections are. So, how um, you use them. Yeah, so really, uh, reflections is uh, reflecting back to uh, the patient um, what it is you want them, what you've heard from them. Um, so... For example, um, they may be telling you your story. It's how really you keep them on track um, so that you can reflect back either an, an aspect of what they've said to um, ensure that you've understood um, what they've said or um, to reflect back um, when you want them to expand on, on something they've said. And that can be used both in the sort of listening for them to tell you um, encouraging them to tell their story um, but also w when you're trying to resolve ambivalence and encourage change yeah and and just we'll give some examples in a second but just moving on to you andrew with regard to mm. i think it's probably obvious what summaries are but you know the the final mm. sort of uh, letter in the ors acronym and tying yeah. it all together yeah um so really the the, the summaries are uh, essentially what you sort of collect your reflections together and you actually provide a bit of a a bit of an overall narrative but i mean the, the way i kind of view it with the with the reflections and the summaries it's where you demonstrate your active listening um and one of the things that i thought was really powerful when i when i had someone talk about it was um with the reflections what you're really trying to do is pick out the the, the change tool you're trying to pick out the bits that actually are giving you an indication that person is willing to engage with change or make some changes so by the time they've they've initially vocalized it they've reflected it well you so you've reflected it back to them if at the end you bring together the summary essentially they've heard that change talk for the third time and that really starts to have quite a powerful impact at, at, at it really resonating um, but the other thing that summaries do really well um, is it just demonstrates to the patient that you have been listening. And I think that's such a powerful thing. And I think we talk about it in all different contexts. But one of the biggest criticisms that comes out of, of, from patients with regards to any healthcare interaction is they felt like they weren't being listened to. They kind of mm. felt like no one was paying attention. And your reflections, particularly if they're skilled and they're on point, make somebody feel like, wow, they've listened to me. That's the first time in you know, 10, 15 years anybody's listened to me about this. The, the, the amount of trust you can build in that, you know, 15 second summary can be quite immense. So, yeah, essentially it's pulling those reflections together and, and kind of summarizing um, everything to the patient, which, which can hopefully lead you towards, you know, the change talk, lead you towards putting a plan in place for them or with them. Yeah. And I think um, the easiest way to do this and this is what I did is you, you go on to go on to various podcasts, go on to YouTube and, and just watch some examples of motivational oh, interviewing. Brilliant. And and actually, you know, we've been talking about this for an hour and it sounds overwhelming and complex, but when you watch experts, you know, people who've been doing this a lot, do it. What we're describing here, people, I'm sure there are people listening going, well, I have half an hour for every new patient. I don't have time for this. You know, this takes minutes. It, it literally takes yeah. minutes for, with, with someone who's very skilled. And I remember the first time we, on my course, we were doing some double-sided reflections and you had to hand back what you'd heard. And they said, make sure you sort of hand it back and end on the change talk. And you were so nervous about handing something back that, that perhaps, and someone's just said, no, that's not what I meant. And that someone said, don't be, don't be afraid to try and, you know, sometimes you'll hand something back and it, you won't land it, but that's okay. Cause it gives you an opportunity to ask them again. So, I mean, I think the example that was used to me was someone said, um, uh, I, I really want to do all my rehabilitation that you said, but I'm just so terribly busy. Um, or, you know, and I, and I, I sort of just, just a simple reflection was so what I'm, what I'm hearing you say is just that, that you're, you're incredibly busy, uh, you're incredibly busy life, but you do understand that your rehab's important. And all I've done is just basically 
re re return the, the question, but given them the, 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 the change talk at the end. And um, I found it incredibly fun to practice. And I love watching people mm. do it who are really, really good at it. Um, on that note, are there any tools that you guys um, would point people to? Um, or is it just a case of just, just get out there, buy the book, buy, buy um, Miller and Rolnick's book, buy, buy, you know, go and listen to some podcasts? Or is there anything that you personally have found really helpful in your journeys? I, I, I personally really think that... Oh, sorry, no, you go ahead, go ahead, I'll go in a minute. I was just going to say there's a BMJ module, which is free, and mm -hmm. it's only an hour introduction to motivation interviewing, which is a great place to start, I think, because it's... It's Amazing. got the explanations and it's got it's got a video in there of somebody actually delivering um, MI. So um, I've got the link. I can send that to you. Yeah, um, great. Middlesex we'll Uni do a great uh, online course as well. Uh, Middlesex Uni. Middlesex Uni. Can we? Can you ping the link to that yeah, in, a, in the comments of the video? Yeah. The one I wanted to mention, I think I mentioned it before, is there's an app called Change Talk, um, yeah, and it's great. one of those role playing apps. It's actually more about childhood obesity. Um, yeah, but, it's, but it doesn't like we say it doesn't matter it's not about the topic it's not about whether you're talking about smoking or obesity or diabetes it's it's about the the principles it's about the the, the practice and, and and things um before we wrap up um craig do we just can we just put up the papers that these guys have published um just so people have also got some uh, references they can head off and read with regard to um the, you know um I'll, po I'll post links to these in the comments later but great do you want to make a comment on the papers i'll scroll through um, them. yeah this this one's from myself um and i guess it, it was um undertaking this piece of research that that uh spurred me on to looking for something more than than the um or changing my clinical practice um, and, it, and it's all about getting inside or behind the patient's experience and understanding why they don't do um, w what you ask them to do and for me it was a real light bulb moment um, in terms of I need to find a better way to treat these patients. Sure and there was this one here from you Andrew. Uh, yeah well, so in interestingly enough um, mine doesn't really sort of delve deeply on on MI as such um, but this here is like an excerpt from my uh, current uh, doctoral work because um, what I'm really focusing on I'm trying to really delve into what patients and practitioners um, identify as, their, as, as motivators towards good self-care practices um, so this kind of focuses in around a lot of what underpins MI so there's the um, information motivation behavioral skills framework there's also some self-determination theory and if anyone is genuinely interested in getting into a bit of MI I would encourage them to have a good read around self-determination theory as well because mm -hmm. the, the principles that introduces underpins a lot of what MI has got to do, uh, got to offer. Sure and this one Jodie? <laughs> yeah this is a systematic review of the literature just to see um, prior to, to conducting um, my own research on feasibility of MI in clinical practice um, this is looking at what evidence is out there already for MI uh, to improve adherence uh, behaviours for preventing diabetic foot ulceration. And there is an evidence gap. So whilst MI has been used in uh, thousands and thousands of different uh, areas, it, it, there's only really one small study of 12 people that uh, it's been used on and that are at risk of ulceration. So uh, watch this space. Right. Sure. Super, and Craig. Right. Just you just put the link up to yeah, um yeah the, the, to the book. Yeah, just trying to get a link to the book that. Yeah, I, I mean that that book is is I think the Bible, but it, it's also quite a big book. There, there is another <laughs> um, book, motivational interview in healthcare. Um, yeah, which is a much much more concise and let's say clinician friendly um, mm. book that that I. I like. I agree. Craig, if you just go back to the normal screen, I'll hold it up. I've just got it on yeah, my desk. Oh, you've got, oh, yeah, you've got it there. I was going to say I've got it here, but yeah, it's good. But... Yeah, I'll, I'll, link, I'll link to the books. I'll link to the papers. I think the other only other paper we got sent is one, someone shared this paper here has been quite an important one. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I just I just really like this. This was, um, it's, it's less of a sort of detailed study, more of a kind of editorial piece. 
Um, but it's really quite current. And one of the things about MI is that a lot of the uh, a lot of the researchers know that it works, but they're trying to tease out which elements of it and, and why it works. Uh, and this particular paper is just a really, really good review of the three main sort of theories around why or how MI works. Um, and it's actually started changing my thoughts on a few things. I recommend people to have a, have, have a look at that. It's, it's only a short paper. Uh, it's, it's a good read. Lovely. So before we wrap up, and before we thank you all so much for your, your valuable time on a Thursday evening, I'm just going to ask you all one, one final question. Uh, well, the same question. I'm going to ask all of you the same final question. And that is to our listening audience, um, if you wanted them, or for someone that's just tuned in that's missed it all, or, or whatever it may be, if you could just give someone one take home, and it can be a little snippet or it can be a sentence, whatever you want it to be, one take home, they're completely new to MI, what's their take home from from this uh, from this episode, Andrew, I'll come to to you first. Um, well, I just suppose it's it's the thing that I found to be most um, sort of salient uh, and the sort of core principle is to sort of remember at all stages that this this is the patient's journey um, rather than our own, and it's it's about getting back into that mindset of thinking. You know, we, we've learned a very specific way of interacting and talking to and even assessing our patients. Uh, and actually a, a sort of fundamental review of this process. And, and, and again, towards that, it's their, it's their journey um, and this needs to be truly sort of concordant rather than um, a bit more passive as it perhaps used to be. Super, thank you. And uh, Joanne, same question. Um, I think probably the most important thing I would like people to take home is the active listening. So it's about... Uh, making sure that, that the patient, it's the patient's story you're listening to. So really, uh, um, uh, maybe a different perspective on what Andrew said. It's uh, make sure you use open-ended questions and be an active listener. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, finally, Jody. You need three times as many reflections as you do open questions for definite. Amazing. You love reflections as much as me. I can see it in your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, open cool. questions aren't as powerful as reflections. That's my that's my experience. Perfect. So read up on reflections and practice them. Excellent, Craig. It's been very quiet from you on with regard to Facebook. Am I to believe yeah. we have had no no real? Um, we've we've had a lot of questions. people a lot of people watching. A lot of people obviously very interested, but no no questions. Just a lot of comments. Uh, just, just agreeing along the way. I think one comment, and I, I, I haven't got time to scroll back, which I found most interesting and probably ref, reflects my opinion. I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've learned a lot, and I think I'm certainly going to have to go and look, look up more about it. But I think a lot of us have been doing little aspects of this anyway, naturally, because we worked out it's probably a better way to go. But I, I think the whole concept of motivational interviewing gives it a context. It gives us a, a, a framework, a, a framework to perhaps do what we. You know, like I, I, I can see little snippets coming through and there was a comment earlier on to that effect that we're, we're doing little aspects of that. I think it might have been Julie might have made that comment. I just can't find it at the moment. So, Okay, perfect as well. Probably a good note to finish because we, the problem is if we go over about 65 minutes, we have to do this as two podcasts. We can't do it as one because they only allow 60 minutes. The video doesn't matter. So thanks, guys. Thanks. It's been really, really good. The hour's gone quick. We could, As per always, we can keep going for a lot longer. There have been a lot of people join late. So if you come back in 10 minutes, Facebook renders the video so you can watch the whole thing from the beginning. I, I now have a much faster internet, so the video will be up on YouTube soon rather than later. Um, and the podcast will be later later as well. So, so thanks, Jody. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Andrew. And Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Bye. It's been great.